Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 129. You know, I love being able to bring you the very best gems in genealogy. And in today's episode, I've got a book gem for you that I know that you're going to love. In fact, we're going to call this our Genealogy Gems Book Club because I know so many of you loved Annie's Ghosts and my interview with the book's author, Steve Luxenberg. And in fact, at the end of this episode, I've got an exciting follow up announcement about Steve and Annie's Ghosts. But since then, I have been keeping a sharp eye out for our next book gem, and I have found it. It's called Running Away to Home by Jennifer Wilson. Now, in this book, Jennifer takes us on a once in a lifetime genealogical journey where she walked in her ancestors' shoes and lived among their descendants. And it's all coming up right after this. It's here, the new version 5 of the award-winning Roots Magic Genealogy software. It makes researching, organizing, and sharing your family history easier and more enjoyable than ever. If you're looking to take the next step in your family history research and start recording your family tree in your own genealogy database, or if you've really been wanting to make a switch to a much more user-friendly program, then do what I did. I chose Roots Magic and I'm really glad that I did. Throughout its 10-year history, Roots Magic has helped people research and share their family trees with innovative features like uh, moving people from one file to another with your mouse, a source wizard to help you document your work, creating a shareable CD to give to family and friends, and running Roots Magic off of a USB flash drive when you're away from home. Roots Magic also received the award for easiest to sync from Family Search for their work in interfacing with that system. Really, what are you waiting for? Download your risk-free trial of Roots Magic 5 at rootsmagic.com. See why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at rootsmagic.com. visit your ancestor's homeland. You know, even though my husband Bill and I had the opportunity last year with our trip to England, where we made our way to all the significant villages in his family tree, the truth is, we were just visiting. To really walk in our ancestor's shoes, it it takes more time, time to live side by side the folks in the town, to do the daily chores, and even, of course, most importantly, to, to gain the trust of those who have the answers that we're looking for. Well, travel author Jennifer Wilson, along with her husband Jim and their two kids, Sadie and Sam, did just that. They packed up, wrangled the necessary visas, and spent four months living in the village of Jen's ancestors, Mirkopai, Croatia. Jen documents their experiences and adventures in her book called Running Away to Home, Our Family's Journey to Croatia in Search of Who We Are, Where We Came From, and what really matters. And I'm so pleased to have joining me today on the podcast to tell us all about the experience firsthand, Jennifer Wilson. Hi, Jen. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me on. Thrilled to have you here. And of course, I have to check with you first off. Did I say Miracle Pie right? You did. <laughs> you did. I was actually <laughs> impressed. It's not an easy word to say. Um, yeah, it's Miracle Pie if you're from there, but Miracle Pie works just fine. Great. Well, and it was wonderful. I felt like by the end of the book, I had had a little lesson in Croatian, you know, the Croatian language, and you had the the little glossary in the back, which was great. 
Um, now, before we jump into too much here, because of course I have a lot of questions for you, and I know my listeners are going to be really interested to hear about your experience. You just told me that you had some exciting news today. Tell us about some acknowledgments that the book is getting. Well, uh, yeah, we, we we had some great news over the weekend. Um, the American Society of Journalists and Authors uh, just recognized Running Away to Home as uh, the best nonfiction book of 2011. So uh, we're, we're celebrating here today, <laughs> or actually probably celebrate for the next year. But yeah, it was uh, pretty, pretty exciting for us. It, it's been a long journey for my whole family. I mean, this was definitely... A family endeavor, and uh, we're this is this is definitely part of our our history together now. Oh, that's fantastic! And of course, I love hearing that books that have to do, to do with our family history are getting acknowledged uh, in the slew of all the books that are out there. That's quite an accomplishment. Yeah, you know, it is. It's a, it's actually the the thing of note within that um, award is that it's for nonfiction. I think so often um, books about your past, your history, your genealogy um, can be kind of lumped into that memoir category, um, which, which you know, is sort of is sort of a, a softer view of reporting, I think. But, but this is, I mean, I really feel like this is recognition for genealogy or genealogical work as actual reporting on your life, and and so that that's why you know the award even means uh, more to us that this is recognized for. Listen, we were digging through history and war and politics and family all at once. It is an actual reporting endeavor, and that's, that, feels, that feels, feels pretty uh, honorable for us right now. Exactly, because the book isn't you um, telling the story that you discovered of them. It's really your story. It's your experience and your family's experience. And it happened to be that you were very focused on um, kind of trying to reconnect your, with your roots. D- did you and Jim just wake up one day? and decide to live in Croatia for a while? I mean, how does something like that happen? <laughs> well, you know, it was, it was kind of something like that. I mean, uh, my, my, um, the last of my immigrant relatives passed away in the summer of 2008, um, and I, I was the only relative who was interested in, her- in inheriting her personal papers. And in them, Sister Paula, uh, she was a nun, wrote that um, her family came from a little village in Croatia called Merkopai, and at about that same time, the economy was kind of going bonkers, and everybody was worried about jobs and money, and are we going to lose the house? Um, and and simultaneously, you know, Jim and I were, were new parents. The kids were four and seven at the time. I guess not super new parents, but we were, you know, kind of trying to figure out what kind of family we wanted, and we were feeling a little disconnected. We were running here and there, and I think I had Sam in soccer by the time he was two years old, and that, you know, just... <laughs> started seeming silly after a while that we were always running and um you know it was all just this sort of blessed uh coincidence that murka pie just began to obsess me um and i i shared with jim that you know it would be interesting if we started talking about going back to where we started from in a very very basic way And as a travel writer, I was really interested in the idea of taking a journey, a long-term journey with my family, using family as an entry point. Um, And it was, you know, he's really a sensible guy. And so when I came downstairs that first night and, you know, sat down my a bottle of wine and two glasses and said, you know, uh, I have a crazy idea. Um, He was on board immediately. and, And I just chalked that up to the sort of, magic of Merkapai because I don't think he ever would have agreed to anything like that in his right mind. It just it just started to roll and um and we never really looked back from there. It was it was kinda crazy. Yeah. Oh I have to tell everybody, once you get done reading the book, you'll fall in love with Jim. He's a sweetheart. Everybody you know, it's so it's so apparent. He reminds me so much of my husband. <laughs> and so just roll the punches and easy going, kinda keeping us all sane. But now, so he was receptive to it. How did Zadie and Sam feel about this crazy idea? Well, um, Zadie was too young at four to really understand what that meant. And, but, but it did mean one thing to her as a kid who had been in child care um, on and off throughout her tiny little life. Um, it meant that she was going to get to be with her mom and dad all the time. And that that was what she wanted, and she was happy to do whatever it took to be together all the time. So that was that was a pretty um, that was a pretty magical thing to figure out, I guess, a little late in the game. 
And um, Sammy, just my, my older son, he, he just kind of refused. He didn't want to go at all. Um, he had no interest. And so we did what any good parent would do in that kind of situation. We just bribed him. Yeah, well, sometimes you got to, you know, it works. <laughs> it's like, we're going to go either way. You can't stay here. So, you know, what's it going to take? Is it going to take a hamster? Is it going to take a DS? I mean, what, what's it gonna, what are we talking here? And that's really how that transaction went, I'm ashamed to say. But listen, that book's all about being honest, so I might as well tell you the truth, right? And you are. You're so honest in the book. And that's what, of course, makes it so refreshing, because we all see glimpses of ourselves. You didn't try to paint yourself as some you know, noble person who was going to... I mean, you really just shared who you were and what you were about. And I thought it was neat that you really wanted to connect with Zadie, because she kind of... You were saying, in some ways, you were seeing yourself in her, but it was like, ooh, that's sometimes the hardest person to connect with. And that's you right. had an amazing experience... Uh, with your daughter. And yet, Sam had a very different experience in that he really learned about kind of being self sufficient, because he didn't have that gaggle of girls in the uh, when you got there that Zadie did. Right, right. Sammy, um, being the oldest kid, he, you know, I think we kind of spoil our oldest a little bit. And, you know, he'd always had what he needed given to him. And um, not that he was a bratty kid at all. Um, he just he just never really was told, you know, deal with it. And mm-hmm. and we got you know we got to the village and and you know Zadie immediately disappeared into the meadow with with our landlord's daughters and you know Sammy was kind of on his own and he struggled for a very little bit with that and I think just sort of decided with you know the love of his parents and. Lots of hugs and lots of pep talks that, that it was time for him to just kind of get it together and make the best. And he's and he's been the kind of guy that can adapt to tough situations ever since. It was it was great for him. He went from being kind of particular about his ways to being a lot more flexible. Travel, I think, gave him that gift. Yeah. Oh, I can and imagine in many ways everybody had to to get a bit more flexible. And you know, in your book, you talked about the fact that well. In reading it, I, I realized, gosh, this is like every genealogist's dream. And yet you were pretty upfront about the fact that you are not a genealogist. In fact, you were kind of saying that genealogy sort of scrambles your brain. And, <laughs> and <laughs> thankfully, you know, your husband, Jim, kind of turned out to be the genealogical hero. Had you talked to him or had you guys made any concrete plans about how you were going to do the genealogy part of this adventure before you went to Mirkapai, or did it just kind of evolve once you got there? You know, we played it by ear a lot in terms of how we were going to handle our time in the village. It, it, we just didn't know what was going to happen next, which is something that I think for the American family these days, that never happens. I mean, yeah. you, pretty much, you pretty much know your day every time you wake up in the morning. And, you know, there's some variations here and there, but I think, and that was part of why I struggled when I first arrived. I mean, I was no longer the captain of that ship. I, <laughs> it, was, it was just a whole different world. In fact, at one point, Zadie um, told me that she felt like she thought we were on another planet. She really thought that we were on a different galaxy, on a different planet, because everything was so different. Um, so we did have to hang really loose. And in terms of genealogy, and I wasn't expecting this for it felt to me like I was balancing a checkbook every time I would sit down with village records and try to draw out a tree. And I don't know if there is some sort of lobe of your brain that you use for <laughs> genealogy, like the paperwork of genealogy, but mine is deeply damaged. <laughs> I, just, I had such a hard time, and I had to sort of resolve that, you know, listen, I'm all in with this. I can't just not do it. Um, and so I guess I had a little bit more of a physical genealogy about the way I approached it, you know, more in recipes and history and gravestones. And Jim, who is an architect, all of that tree drawing made perfect sense to him. I mean, it took him five minutes to do something. I had spent two weeks in the local bar trying to, you know, pouring over with cups of coffee, trying to figure out where this would go and where that would go. It was, it was, it worked out pretty well. We were lucky in the end. Well, it can't be the the check balancing part of our brain because that part of my brain literally doesn't function. I don't even know if I've ever really balanced a checkbook, but I I can do the trees. But but I know what you mean in terms of there's kind of an analytical side. That's not my favorite side of the whole process. You sound like you really enjoy the the context of the family and the stories, and he was able to put structure around it, it really sounded like. 
That's right. And and without the two of us working together, uh, we wouldn't have made the discoveries that we did. And, and so it was another way that I think, you know, he and I um, figured out that we do work together really well. I mean, it was, I was, I'm the more emotional kind of gut feeling person. I'm drawn toward people and their stories and um, he can kind of put it all together. And he, you know, because of him, we made more connections than we would have if it had just been me. Oh, that's great. And it wasn't really even his family. I mean, it was your side of your family. Um, but that's really cool. Now, you write about being introduced to the people of Mirkapai and how exuberantly they received you. In fact, I, put, I have a section here. You wrote, um, this was a celebration of the homeland, and I was part of the show. People had left Mirkapai for generations because of war or poverty or general misery. I came back, and not because it was some big tourist destination or anything. We were here because something powerful in Mirkapai had pulled us here. My family's return was a source of pride for all of us on that day. And as I was reading this, I was thinking how true that is, that it was really significant to that town that somebody had come back. You know, when we're doing genealogy, we don't really think about the impact it's having on other people. And, of course, here in the U.S., we really don't have the same type of experience because we're always moving around. So it sounded like you experienced a real connection to your ancestors and to the town kind of right out of the gate. Tell us a more what that was like. It had to have been a little scary at first. Yeah, you know, I, I guess I didn't even count on that part of the equation. I mean, it was when I, when I um, started making those connections and I was so excited and I felt a certain gravity, um, seeing my own roots sort of unfold in front of me. I mean, that was huge. It was, you know, daily moments of tears when you sort of realize where you are from, physically, emotionally, geographically, all of those things. <laughs> What I didn't have any idea was going to happen was that it meant a lot to the people of Merkapai and the, the parish, the county, who we met um, as a result of our, our searching. Um, it meant a lot to them, too. And I, I didn't count on that at all. It, you know, they... I think, um, especially my generation, uh, we feel like, you know, traveling, you always feel a little, you don't want to be an ugly American, you always wonder how people are going to receive you, you know, depending on what political situation or that your country is in around the world. Um, so I, you know, I, I didn't even have any thoughts about how someone might receive me from another country. And, you know, here, these guys were crying, too, when I found a relative, and, and they were so... Um, they were so honored that someone came back for them and to see who they were and to recognize that. I think Americans find it so easy to forget their history because it's not, it's not visual in most households. We don't, we don't talk about it very much except, oh, I'm Italian, you know, and yeah. that sort of thing. But, I mean, there, the fact that I came back and wanted to know it, it, I got almost a feeling that they felt they had been forgotten, and now now they weren't anymore. And and that was so humbling to me. I mean, it was. I just. I can't put words to it. It was so touching, and it was. It just. Uh, it had a lot of gravity. Those moments. Yeah, I mean, you really honored them in the sense that you were you were saying by your presence, "Wow, you guys are worth coming back to. <laughs> this country and this place is so important." And it's interesting because I've, I've found as I've traveled internationally that the everyday folks on the street, they don't really do the ugly American thing. They don't pay much more attention to politics. They're going to work just like we're going to work. I, in general, I have found such a positive response. And uh, it sounds like for them, it was much more about family than any kind of perception of international affairs. That's right. That's right. And, you know, there was also sort of a there was a worry on their part. I mean, Croatia has been through so much heartache and war 
in trouble over the past 100 years, over the past 1,000 years, um, that I think that there was, you know, the people in the village didn't embrace me immediately. And I think they, it was still was a few days. It was pretty quick, but it was a few days. And I think they had to see that I wasn't, I wasn't there to write Borat or something. Yeah. I wasn't there to make, make, make fun of their little village ways. But I was there because we had lost something, and, and I was looking for it. Mm-hmm. That that had to become apparent to them before they came out of the house and welcomed me fully. And um, so there was sort of a question of how does she perceive us, and what do you guys think about our role in World War II? I mean, I didn't even have the heart to say I don't think most Americans know you had a role in World War II. To be honest right. with you, so I wouldn't I wouldn't sweat it if I were you, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And, and that brings me to this, you were saying, um, kind of, you were there to find out what you had lost. And I know when you first set out, you had a lot of stress, I guess, about what was going on in terms of your family life, what you wanted to have go on, and kind of what you perceived as your role and being a mom and, and that whole thing. And and I thought it was really interesting, at least to me, I thought that one of the, the truly unsung heroes in your book was Goranka, uh, Robert's wife. And Robert was your landlord. And it's it's funny, as I read the book, you never really focused on her, but she always seemed to be moving around the edges of your time there. And so much wouldn't really have been possible, I don't think, without her. What was your relationship with both Robert, the brown bear, as you call him, and Garanka, his wife? And, and how did you, how did your perception of her and, and the role of women there in Mirkopai evolve as time went on? That's a great question, and I, it's, that you noticed something that was important in the book, and I, and I almost wished that I could bring Garanka forward more in the book as a character, but the truth was I didn't know her, Yeah, and we might, we might have spent so much time around each other um, and around each other's families, but um, I do think that she was a little bit emblematic of a typical woman in a country that maybe has not caught up to um, sort of equality standards in a, in a social sense. There was, first of all, our landlord, Robert, um, he, he also owned the town bar. <laughs> and, he and, I, he and I had a very um, love-hate, brother-sister, picking-on-each-other um, relationship from almost the beginning. And um, Robert was a former rock star and uh, a good-time guy, and he did a lot of drinking. And a lot of the people, a lot of the men in the village, not all of them by any means, but a lot of the men in the village did a lot of drinking too, and not a lot of working from what I saw. <laughs> Um, but the women were always completely busy, whether they were tending their gardens or cleaning the car or fixing the house up or making food or picking tea flowers or doing this or that. I mean, pretty much taking care of everything all the time. And as a result, you don't see them much. And um, so I had to directly seek out women, and then, you know, eventually they started doing the same for me. There's a like a little song for that, like five brothers, five middles making a house, but they don't live in it. <laughs> but with Garanka, I mean, she had zero English, and I don't think, Garanka is his wife, and um, she had zero English, and I don't think had the confidence to try out what little she knew. So, you know, we would... But I think that she got Robert to sober up and help us out every time he did. And I, you know, Robert would say he was too swamped to make a telephone call to ask about a relative. And then I'd see Garanka kind of walk by, say something under her breath and keep walking. And the next thing you know, Robert's on the phone. <laughs> so, I mean, I think, I think that she orchestrated, like so many of the women there, um, the action behind the book without 
making a lot of noise about it. And and yeah, you you, were, you did a great job noting that because she is there, and I, I wish I had known her better, but she was so shy. She wouldn't even, uh, she didn't ever want to be interviewed. She said she had nothing to say. She was not of interest. Mm, interesting. And yet, you would, I, I found myself admiring her and so many of the women that you met. And even though maybe the uh, the balance of work wasn't equal over there, you had to really give them their, their props for working so hard and for keeping it all together. They really sounded like they were the glue in terms of the family, which I think is, you know, regardless of uh, female politics is still the truth. We are still the yeah, glue. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And, 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 you know, uh, Robert made a point of saying, you know, when Jennifer ro- arrived in the village, we got a woman as a prime minister. And how did that happen? Like, <laughs> I had nothing to do with it, brother. But I tell you, you things are going to change for the better, I'm betting. Yeah. Um, but it, it was, um, yeah, they, they did, the women were the glue. <laughs> And you'll notice in the book, um, anytime Tutelich came around, he was the tourism guy who never actually did any tourism assistance. Right. Um, or whenever he comes around, it's kind of this foreboding of something bad's about to happen. But any time any of the women come on the scene, you'll notice that things are about to change for the better. And that was a consistent pattern <laughs> in Mercapai. Yeah, absolutely. God, God bless him. Absolutely. God bless him. <laughs> yeah, he, he was quite a character. Now, you described meeting your first cousin twice removed, as Jim figured out. Uh, is that Frango? How do you say his name? Franio. Franio. And you were describing that meeting him, and he was one of the early people that you met in terms of family connections, that that was changing the whole landscape of your family in an instant. What did you mean by that? You know, I I guess I had never, I, I was the only one in my family who was curious about what our history was. And I don't know why that is. Maybe it was because I'd always been a reader and I loved those um, backstories. Um, but I had never known anything about any of them. I, I have first cousins I don't even really know. Our, um, my mom and my dad weren't, um, they just didn't drag us around to family things. And uh, so when I met Franjo, it sort of it sort of shattered my whole idea that my family was finite, you know, that it was the small group of people I spend Christmas with. All of a sudden, it was, I, this man was as, almost as close to me as my own beloved grandmother, and I had never seen him. And we had, we had some of the same blood running through our veins, and, and that sort of possibility and that sort of expanding family, it just, it really just blew my mind. I'd never really thought about it in such a, a, a real sense. And I don't think that, I don't think I can move on in my life after that moment without the understanding that I am somehow connected to most places in this world. And I mean, you have to, you have, you have to stay connected by knowing what's going on everywhere because you're probably related somewhere there. I mean, there's, exactly. some, there's, some, there's some connection somewhere that should matter to you. It, whether you know it yet or not, it's going to happen or it did happen. And I mean, to me, it just seems all encompassing. And, and it was, it just, it just shattered my preconceived notions about family. I think that's probably that concept is one that really is what made me addicted to doing family history research. Because having grown up with, you know, one sister, small nuclear family, you move away from the hometown, and you're not close enough to visit relatives on a regular basis, you start to just feel so tiny. And as soon as I started opening up the family history, all of a sudden, this, it was like this huge group of people came welcoming me back, you know, in, and you just felt like your world expands. And somehow you feel loved, even if you never meet them or never have that opportunity. It's just the sense that we belong to something bigger, certainly bigger than this tiny little nuclear family that we, that we grow up in. That's right. I mean, I would, sit, um, I would sit at the table of people that I hadn't known the day before, and 
I was the honored guest with piles of food that they probably couldn't afford, but that scraped the barrel to do so, uh, having me feast like a queen yeah. at their table because I was family. And I just thought, I, I just, I had no idea even how to receive that kind of gratitude or that kind of um, outpouring of love from complete strangers to me. And I know it freaked the kids out too, because Zadie, I remember once asking like, who are these people? I'm like, they're <laughs> They're our family, you know, and and there's there's a lot of them out there. We've just found a couple more. You it know? sounds like they must have been feeling it, too, it just instinctually, you know, probably couldn't put their finger on it either, but they just knew the food needed to come out. Yeah, yeah, and it, I, think, I think you're right. And, you know, a lot of tears and a lot of, you know, grabbing me by the shoulders and examining my face, and, you know, it was... It was jarring. For a Midwesterner, I have to tell you, there was so much more emotion in those rooms than I am comfortable with. Um, wow. But it's, you know, it's, it's stuff that, that'll stay with us forever. And, um, and we've, we've kind of re- rewritten our own family history by opening up, opening up these new chapters of, of our family book, you know. Yeah. Now, I have a few more genealogical type questions, but I, I have to grab onto what you just said, which was you used the word gratitude, and you talked in the book about finding gratitude, and kind of that the, the whole experience really made you realize how lucky you were to live in America. What, how, what was that experience like? And, and what did you come away with in terms of the gratitude in your life? You know, you talked a little bit at the beginning of our, our discussion here about um, how I didn't make an effort to make myself um, look like the hero of this story throughout. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was part of that that was very intentional on, on my behalf in that I think I was, I was somewhat like a lot of Americans when I first got there, that I was just, you know, a little bit discontented and confused. I didn't know what I wanted. And you know, a little bit whiny about, well, my God, now how did I get here and what's going on? And all of a sudden, um, I start meeting these people and learning some things about my family and my history that does instill in you this sort of gratitude as a child of immigrants, you know? I mean, they had, because my great-grandparents had this incredible bravery I mean, you can call it what you want, stupidity, blindness, I don't know. But <laughs> to me, it was bravery. Yeah. But they had, the first guy, Valentin Radosevich, had $14.50 in his pocket when he left Croatia for the United States, a country he couldn't speak a word of their language. I mean, that blows my mind. Yeah. I packed for four days for a trip that lasts 48 hours, you know? Right. And, and so in doing that and have and his wife coming along, they spared uh, my my family one hundred years of war and hunger and famine and um, bloodshed and fighting amongst each other. I mean, these were things they saw things weren't going to go so great, and they're going to try it somewhere else for the future generations. and i don't I don't. I don't think that way anymore, that maybe we don't have enough or the American dream is not working out like we thought it would. The American dream is up to us, you Mm -hmm. know, and and it's to be grateful that we are so far along beyond where they were when they got here. And this is the country where you can drop your baggage and move forward no matter who you are. And and that is, that's really important. And it's a, it's a mantle of gratitude that um, I don't think any of us in my family, all four of us will never drop again. I mean, you have your days when you're just like, oh, I can't believe this or that. But it's it's nothing compared to, you know, having your village invaded by four different nations in four different years. I mean, there's it pales in comparison any problem we would have here. Oh, yeah. And, and that's such a gift. It's such a gift. I was thinking what a gift it was for all of you to experience that, particularly kids at a young age, but also that you were able to do this you're still fairly young, and you had an opportunity to come in contact with people who were still old enough to remember. And I know that you talked about the fact that you really had to come face to face with a lot of violent history that you learned about America Pie. And right. in the book, you said, um, I would never again think of any war as storybook simple. And that really hit home to me be- for folks who are researching family history. A lot of times, you know, you run into ancestors who fought in wars, and you're looking at documents, and 
They seem kind of sterile and they're kind of, you know, just the facts, ma'am. And it's really easy to start thinking about this in very simplistic terms and you lose kind of sight or, or never get in touch with that incredible impact of those events in those people's daily lives. And the fact that it would literally move a person to get on a sh- ship with $14.50, you know, and him feeling like he- he's getting ahead in the game, <laughs> even though he's going out with so little. That's, that's my best option to get on a boat with yeah. $14.50 and go to a foreign country. That's going to work out the best according to what's happening now. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you're right. I mean, it, genealogy, digging around in your past is, not for the faint of heart, that's for sure. And um, I've, I've actually had people say, well, you know, I would love to look into my family history, but, you know, our family came from this country or this country, and we just don't want to know what happened. And I, and I thought, you know, that's so sad, because if you don't know what happened, then how do you know, that you, how do you know you're going to avoid letting that happen in your own country or letting that happen in your own city? You know, you, you, we should know. It never hurts to know more about where you came from, what what brought you here. I mean, those things shouldn't be, you shouldn't be afraid of that stuff. I mean, it's it's all part of how you got here. Um, it, it, when I think about Merkapa, I, I was first so shocked to find out um, some of the history that had happened, especially around the World War II era. And I thought, oh my God, my ancestral village, they were on the bad side of World War II, what? Yeah. But, you know, um, the, the oldest people in the village sort of reminded me, some more sharply than others, that, listen, we had terrible choices. We could have gone with Nazi Germany or Communist Russia. And that <laughs> was, those, those, were, those were the choices. And, you know, and if I press that issue, because, you know, in the United States, we learn a very um, sort of a straightforward story about that war. Um, when I pressed the issue, one man actually said to me, You know, many of us talked before your family got here that we agreed not to hold it against any of you that your country started a war in Iraq. Mm -hmm. That had nothing to do with you, and we knew it. So we're not going to hold it against you. So I would hope that you would not hold this against us. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to shut up now. (laughs) (laughs) That's a great point. I appreciate that. that, uh, I appreciate that form of logic. And um, that that was another watershed day in the village. Yeah, you never really know what you would do in that situation unless you were knee deep in it. I, I, that's what a great perspective. And tell us more about your genealogical pursuits. I was cheering for you when you finally got your hands on the book of names. <laughs> tell us what the book of names was and how did you finally get access to it? Each village, and I, I think this is a universal thing, uh, each ancient village has has its sort of book of recorded events, birth, death, marriage, that sort of thing. And um, the, the one in Merkapai was held at the local church. And the, the priest of the local church was in, was in charge of the book. And um, there's a lot of sort of gnarled history behind how the book got there and the priest that was looking at, overlooking it. But um, what ended up happening is that he was very reluctant to let anyone touch the book. And he was very reluctant to let me get my hands on the book because I'd kind of treated it as a blasé thing at first. I thought, oh, cool, that's the book. And I reached over to grab it, and it was <laughs> like, you know, I, had, I, I he had been burned. And, you know, I was like, no, nobody touches this book. Are you kidding me? And um, so it took a lot of wheedling, a lot of returns to the priest's residence. It got to the point that I was a public nuisance and just begging to see this thing. <laughs> and then I forgot that... When you're Catholic and you want a favor from the priest, I mean, this is how this guy makes his extra spending cash, maybe make a little offering. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I uh, laid a little cash down on the table, and boy, the book popped out, and <laughs> away we went. So it was pay to play, and, and, that, and it worked out. So that was, that was finally how I got even a glimpse of the book, but it, it sure wasn't anything like... Uh, it sure wasn't anything like hours and hours of relaxing time with the book. <laughs> it yeah. didn't work out that way. Oh, but, you know, it was it was so great when it finally happened. And, and I won't give it away, but, you know, you, you go through different gyrations of thinking you found things. And maybe, you know, you had to keep kind of digging in to really make get to the place where you felt like you had accurate information. And, and um, I thought your your book is such a reminder that we don't want to stop with the first find. 
you know, that we want to keep asking and keep moving around the edges of it so that we get the full picture. Exactly. And I think that that is, um, if I had just sort of declared victory when I saw the book and I saw those names written in the old calligraphic hand, I, it would have, that I would have lost so much in the book itself because, I mean, there were so many steps to go beyond that. Right. And I'm sure if we went back to Merkapi, we would find even more steps beyond that. I, since this book has come out, there has been um, a Facebook page that started called Descendants of Merkapi, Croatia. And people from all over the world are now finding connections in Merkapi. <laughs> and, and, I mean, I'm sure that I could write a whole village worth of stories at this point with some of the crazy stuff that I've been hearing on there. To you know, I was smuggled in the skirts of my great aunt so-and-so on the way to Arizona. I mean, this, it's, it's, uh, there's so much more beyond that first, woo, there's the names. You know? yeah. it's, where, where's the houses? And where are their relatives? And, and how, did, how did they meet? And I mean, all of that stuff just really gave a depth to the story. And it always comes back to connecting with the people. And whether it's social connecting online or whether it's being there in person, you know, it's, it's all about that. You know, this has been a pretty incredible experience. Would you try another extended stay in another ancestral village? Are you planning to at some point go back to Mirkopai? Um. Yes, on both counts. I'm, I'm right now working on a novel um, that is, it's not directly connected to genealogy, but it does have some genealogical connections within it that sort of bring about the, the, the main action in the book. So that's been, I seem to be obsessed with cemeteries and things that happen in cemeteries <laughs> and things that come from cemeteries. Yeah. And it's kind of leak, it's leaving, leaking over into the novel. Um, but after that is finished, we, we probably will take another trip. And um, whether that is going back to Merkapai, because so many things have happened since we were gone, um, both sad and peculiar. Um, whether we go back to Merkapai itself or use that as sort of a starting point to uh, maybe look at Jim's family ancestry a little bit. Uh, he has some really fascinating roots that he knows absolutely nothing about. And his immediate family are either scattered or... Um, have passed away, and so there'll be a lot more um, sleeping to do in that case. He's got family from a, a Norwegian fjord that's a little fishing village there. Mm. And the other one is that Alsace-Lorraine region that's sometimes France and sometimes Germany. Right now right. it's France. Um, but it's a big culinary region. And Jim is, um, he's a, he loves to cook. And he's it about the food. Book. Yeah, it would, be, it would be really cool to try to um, sort of track down a little bit of Jim's history looking through the food, which is something that I think he finds great comfort in, in the way that I find writing uh, great comfort. Oh, that's, that sounds wonderful. Now, I have to ask you finally about the, the village anthem, um, the song of Mirkapai. It's what, Malo Po Malo? When did you first hear the song, and, and what does that mean? Malo is little by little, and you know I'm surprised no one's ever asked me about that song before. Because once I heard the words of it, and at the time that I heard it in the village, I mean that was again another Merkapai miracle. I, I was kind of at the cusp of feeling like I belonged there, and maybe I didn't, and I was still wandering kind of my place in the village when we were invited to the baptism of uh, of a baby in in a village that is very old and births don't happen all that much. And we were treated like family at this gathering where there were tamboritas and the, you know, the, the rockio was flowing and there were just plates heaping with, with sheep and lamb and salads and everything you can think of. And the music is loud and it was, it was lovely. And all of a sudden they start playing for, for me, for us, my family, the, the village song, which was Malo Po Malo. It means little by little. It describes the mountains and the trees and the hills and how little by little, Merkapai, I will come to you. And it was, I, I had 
tears streaming down my face. There's actually a little video footage of that in the um, in the little um, trailer for the book that you can find on Jennifer-Wilson.com that, you know, was just, the song stayed in my mind and it, and I asked everyone to sing it for me. I, everyone in the village hated that song by the time we left. Because I'm like, can you sing Mala Pamala? Can we, at the end of our evening together, can we sing Mala Pamala? And it was, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was as if it had been written for us. And I'm sure that in a way it was. I mean, it was written for everyone in Merkapai. You, you might not be able to stay there, uh, but you'll always find your way back. And I think it's the perfect anthem for this book, Running Away to Home. And little by little, you got there, it sounds like. What a wonderful adventure. And I I have to just say thank you for sharing it in a book, because I enjoyed every single page of it. And I know that those listening, uh, after hearing you talk about that experience, will want to read it as well. Jennifer, thank you so much for taking time out to share a very personal experience and for being here on the podcast. I hope you'll come back when your next book comes out and tell us more about those cemeteries. Oh, definitely. And it's been an absolute pleasure visiting with you. It's a lot of fun. Thanks so much for joining me for Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 129. And a very special thank you to Jennifer Wilson for sharing her experience writing her book, Running Away to Home, with us on the podcast. If you'd like to get a copy of the book, you can do so and help support this free podcast by buying it through the Amazon links on the Genealogy Gems website. So all you have to do is go to genealogygems.com and search for Running Away to Home in the Amazon box there that you'll find on the homepage. Or you can click on podcast in the menu and you can navigate your way to episode 129. And there in the show notes, you will find an Amazon ad for the book as well. You can just click that. It's going to take you over to Amazon and uh, you'll be able to find the book and anything else you're looking for. And as always, I really appreciate how you support this podcast. And I'm thrilled to be able to offer a way that you can help us keep producing it and uh, it doesn't cost you anything extra. So thank you so much for doing that. And many of you uh, who have been asking for the Android Genealogy Gems app, I want to let you know Amazon is the place to get it. So while you're there or if you're looking for the app, go to our Amazon search box, just type in Genealogy Gems, and you will be able to download the Genealogy Gems app and get that from Amazon. I've also put together a very special little companion video to today's episode. If you'd like to see some of the things that you heard and um, that Jennifer talked about. Now, Genealogy Gems app users will find the video as your bonus content for this episode. So you can just click on bonus content in the app and watch it there. And it's also available for viewing in the show notes and at my Genealogy Gems YouTube channel, which is at youtube.com slash genealogy gems. If you enjoyed this episode, you're going to love the video. If you love it, please do me a favor. Click the thumbs up button for the video at YouTube. Um, you'll find it right underneath the video because the more positive ratings and comments that a video receives, um, the higher that the video ranks in YouTube and Google. And of course, that means that more people will find the videos and enjoy them just like you did. And you'll also find ways there on YouTube to share the video through Facebook and Twitter for all you tweeters out there. So again, thank you so much for helping to bring genealogy gems to all the genealogists out there. And as promised, I have a special announcement for you. I am very, very pleased to announce that Steve Luxenberg's interview here on the podcast has led to a um, very special treat for those of you who will be attending the Southern California Genealogical Jamboree, which is coming up June 7th through the 10th. On the 7th, they're going to have their special writers conference, the uh, pre-event day, and then the conference itself runs June 8th through the 10th. Well, Thursday morning... Steve Luxembourg and I are going to be kicking off 
the Writers' Conference portion of Jamboree with a very special conversation with the author session. Steve's going to join me on stage and sit down for an in-depth discussion about Annie's ghosts and the job of crafting such a compelling family history story. And then throughout the Writers' Conference, Steve's going to be there teaching a variety of classes to help you, the genealogist, write your family stories. It's an incredible opportunity to learn from the very best. I'm also going to be there teaching four additional classes throughout the conference weekend. So Steve and I certainly hope that you will join us there for an amazing weekend at the Southern California Genealogical Society's Jamboree. And if you'd like more information on that, I will have it all there for you in the show notes for this episode number 129. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon. 